Leroy Chow, good to have you with us. Leroy, of course, you know, uh, three shuttle missions and one Soyuz mission, which included a 190 plus day stay on the International Space Station as the commander of the space station. Uh, thanks for uh, joining me, Leroy. I, I've been watching the Chinese mission. It, it, you know, it's hard to tell, of course, because it's a bit opaque to say the least. But um, it seems like it's been a success. If you, if looking at it from, I, I know you've been watching it as closely as anybody, sure. uh, as one of the handful of um, prior to the Chinese endeavors, a handful of people of Chinese descent to go to space. And, and you have spent a lot of time over in China talking with them about their program. Give us a sense of how uh, successful you think this mission might have been. Well, to me, it looks like it's been a home run. Uh, I haven't seen any flaws at all. The, the launch looked good. Uh, there were no anomalies and you know nothing that we heard on the downlink that would indicate any problem with the launch. They got into orbit. They were able to phase their orbit and automatically dock again. Uh, you know, no indications of any problems. They docked on schedule, entered the module, and then uh, stayed docked for 10 days. And uh, most impressively, a couple of days ago, they were actually able to get into their spacecraft, uh, the Senju-9, and demonstrate manual docking several times. And that's a huge deal. And now they, they're planning to undock, or I believe they may have undocked already, and they're coming back down, uh, landing this evening, uh, U.S. time. So um, the manual docking, that's, that's as big a deal as any. If you had to you know, prioritize the, the accomplishments of this mission, you'd have to put that one at the top, I would think. Oh, absolutely. They had previously demonstrated automatic docking late last year with the Senju-8 mission, which was unmanned, and uh, demonstrated they could automatically dock the Tiangong-1. This time they did it again, and then the manual docking, as you say, is the biggest deal. Uh, that's because if there was a failure, of course, in the automatic system, they could take manual control and do it. And that has happened before in the past. Uh, it happened on our mission uh, when I flew to the space station with Russian equipment. We had a failure of the automatic system, and we had to do a manual docking. So with this capability, it enables them to do on-orbit operations of you know building and operating a space station and uh, using low Earth orbit as a jumping off point to go to the moon or, or anywhere else. This module that they docked at, uh, it, is it accurate to describe it as you know the first stage of a space station, do you think? Or is this just part, uh, are they thinking much uh, bigger and grander? Right, they are thinking much bigger and grander. And you can think of Tiangong 1 as a, a orbital module. You know, it's, I, I hesitate to call it a space station, but I'd call it a man tended station in that you know, it's not obviously not permanently uh, occupied by astronauts, but they demonstrate the ability to dock to it and then conduct operations, like this time for 10 days, first time. And uh, I imagine they conducted some kind of scientific investigations on board. I've seen the mock up, the training uh, unit of Tiangong 1. Uh, when I was over in Beijing, and uh, it's about two-thirds, I would describe it as roughly two-thirds the habitable volume of the Space Lab module that we used to fly in back of the, you know, in the space shuttle. So what's next for the Chinese? There's all, you know, so much speculation about what their goals are in space. Sure. You, you know them as well as anybody, any Westerner, put it that way. Uh, what would you say they're up to? Well, they've announced they're going to build Tiangong 2, and they're going to launch that, I believe, maybe later, as soon as later this year, and it's going to be a bigger, more capable orbital module. So that would, I think that will be more of a true man-tended space station. And then they have, of course, plans to build a, uh, uh, a real, a much bigger space station, probably like a Mir-class space station using a, a core module similar to what we have on the ISS, and then building out, and so that docking several modules to that, laboratory modules, things like that to basically make a mere class space station. So not quite as big as the International Space Station, but certainly a, um, a, a mere sized station. After that, uh, they've made, you know, they've alluded to plans to land astronauts on the moon. They've no, uh, put out no concrete plans to do that, but uh, I have to believe they're, they're aiming for the moon because the moon culturally is such a, an important thing to China and to, to you know, all the Asian countries. Uh, it's hard to imagine that they're not planning to do that. They're, they're planning uh, unmanned missions there, rover missions, things like that. And, of course, they're building their Long March 5 rocket, which is uh, uh, an advanced cryogenic rocket. You know, they're going to have their, their first liquid hydrogen or, you know, large-scale liquid hydrogen, uh, liquid oxygen engines in the first uh, core stage. They're building their launch facility in on Hainan Island. Uh, I understand that's going to be where they're going to move all their uh, human operations. And so at five degrees latitude, Hainan is an ideal place to launch the moon. I can't help but thinking of the fable of the tortoise and the hare here. They're slow, they're steady, they have a 30-year plan. Uh, they don't have a messy little democracy which gets in the way of a 30-year plan. 
Uh, they have a way of uh, following through on, on their milestones, even over a long period of time. Sure. Ultimately, in the end, w will, the, will the tortoise uh, end up triumphant here and we, being the hare, uh, grounded on Earth looking at what the Chinese have accomplished? Well, the thing is this, Miles. I mean, you know, a lot of, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, big deal, they docked in space. You know, we did that in the 60s, so did the Soviet Union. Well, that's true, but, you know, I mean, look, the fact is now China can do it too, and that enables them to do all these other things. And, you know, their technology, I've seen their technology up close and personal, and it is good stuff. I mean, they, they're very advanced. Uh, they're very capable. They've got plans to, like I said, build cryogenic rockets, uh, have more capabilities. What they lack is operational experience. This is only their fourth space mission. You know, and so they lack the, the operational experience of the United States and the Soviet Union. But look where we are. You know, we we no longer have the ability to launch our own astronauts into space. We're hitching rides with uh, with Russia, and uh, you know, sure, we've got commercial things going on. But how many years is that going to take before it comes online? And China, as you say, is slow and steady, and they are coming up. And it makes sense to me to partner. You know, the United States continues you know, in, in a sense, leading the efforts in human spaceflight by being the lead partner of the International Space Station. And, you know, it makes total sense to me to invite ch countries like China, who have publicly, uh, not that long ago, uh, voiced, uh, you know, that they wanted to join the ISS program. And uh, that leads, of course, to an international partnership to lead human exploration beyond LEO, beyond low Earth orbit. And it makes sense for us to lead that effort. And this is one way to, for us to maintain our leadership is to invite countries like China who are developing their own capabilities into this partnership. You know, it kind of reminds me, I'm, I'm thinking of all these uh, little, um, uh, uh, um, oh gosh, I'm thinking of trite cliches this morning, but <laughs> there's the, that one about keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. Right. I'm not saying China is an enemy, but if you operate under that assumption, you can make a pretty strong argument that, that bringing the Chinese into the space station partnership would be a good idea. Well, sure. And, you know, I mean, whoever thought of a major partner in space with, civil space with uh, the former Soviet Union? I mean, we, we had the Cold War for how many, how many decades, and, and our nuclear missiles still have our nuclear missiles pointed at each other, at each other yet we managed to make this partnership work. And for those that say, well, you know, China's going to steal our technology, well, to my knowledge, there's been no, there have been no technology transfers, illegal technology transfers in either direction with Russia. So why would it happen with China? And look what it's done to our relationship. I think, you know, although uh, you could argue that uh, the U.S. and Russian relationship isn't great right now in general, I think it'd be much worse if we weren't both cooperating on this big civil project that's together. That's a good point. Although the, uh, the Chinese uh, Shenzhou does bear a lot of similarities to yes. the Russian Soyuz. I mean, y y can you say that they, they managed to trade technology without, in a way that would make the U.S. Ha uh, comfortable, put it that way? Well, you know, Russia, uh, they cooperated with Russia in this, obviously. You know, you look at their spacesuits, look at their spacecraft, look at uh, the way they conduct operations. It's all very Russia-like. Now, they, they don't like the admit that. In fact, they'll, they'll tell you all their stuff is indigenous and homegrown, and it is all manufactured and designed there in China, but they had, you know, they, they bought and uh, cooperated with Russia, bought technology, and, and used kind of leapfrogged, and were able to build stuff that, you know, was modified Russian gear and Russian operations. So, um, you know, I think it was all on the up and up. I don't think anything was uh, illegally transferred from Russia to China. I think it was all cooperation and, and purchased. So, politics here could ultimately create a scenario where by 2020, we have no International Space Station anymore. That's, that's its expected lifetime. And there could very well be a Chinese space station in operation. And uh, if we went to the Chinese then and asked to participate in that, I suspect the answer might be no, right? Well, hard to say. I mean, you know, uh, that, that is a possible scenario. Certainly, uh, space station, as you say, currently is slated for a lifetime end at 2020. Of course, you're aware of you know, to show the operator at 2028, so maybe it'll get a, a new lease on life. But it's certainly possible that we end up one day with no ISS, and the Chinese have built their station, and they're the only station up in the sky. You know, in that case, what do we do? You know, do we just build a new station ourselves? I frankly don't see that. Um, you know, by that point, have we gone beyond uh, low Earth orbit in our exploration? You know, uh, hard to say. It, it, it seems as if we're kind of watching this... Um slow motion train wreck unfolding here for the yes, U.S. space yes. program. Well, and, and, and no one seems uh, able to stop it. Why? 
Well, you know, I, I think there's a, a couple of reasons. Number one, in the U.S., we've become, you know, we've become used to being the leader in, in human spaceflight. We just take it for granted. The shuttle program was so successful in that we were launching several shuttles a year, and except for the two accidents, uh, you know, people kind of took it for granted. It became commonplace. Uh, we were operating International Space Station. It was, to the U.S. public, it was no big deal. Now that we no longer have shuttle, you know, we're not launching, but, uh, but we're still conducting space station ops, and and uh, frankly, I think most of the American public has become kind of blasé about it. Um, and so, you know, by that, because of that, politicians don't really pay much attention to it. And, uh, you know, they're, they've got other things they're thinking about, the other major issues, campaign issues. You'll notice none of them are about space. You know, I mean, a couple of the candidates early on um, talked about space, but then they got, they got kind of uh, uh, made fun almost. And, uh, and it's true, some of their proposals were not all thought out. But, um, yeah, I'm worried about it. I, I'm concerned about what this country is going to do because, uh, you know, you and I, you were from the generation that was inspired by Apollo, and it wasn't just uh, for people to go into technical fields, I think. I think even people who were studying the arts, uh, you know, literature, things like that, it made them excited too, and it made them want to reach a little higher and try a little harder. And, and I think it does so much for a national prestige, and that's why the Chinese are doing it. That's why the Soviet Union did it, and that's why we did it. I mean, the main reason, and, and a lot of people don't like to admit it, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's good for the country. So um, you must be a bit ambivalent. You're, you're an American, a proud American, with strong roots to China. Uh, do you find yourself sort of cheering for the Chinese and yet not, or, or you know? How... Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I'm not. I'm not battling myself. Yeah, as you say, I'm, I'm an American for sure. I've served as an American astronaut, and and you know, I advocate uh, everything, every way I can to keep the American program going. Uh, but, yeah, I am, you know, my heritage is Chinese. I'm proud of what they're doing. I'm, I'm impressed with what they're doing, and especially as you talked about earlier, their long-term commitment to this. And, uh, you know, gosh, it would, I, I really think we ought to work together, you know, and if we get uh, certain members of Congress over it, uh, I think it'd be a great partnership, and it would, in the long run, uh, better relations between our two countries. I mean, people point at the 2007 anti-satellite test the Chinese conducted when they blew up one of their old weather satellites, creating orbital debris and and causing a, an outcry, as there should have been an outcry. Now think about it. If they had been a partner in you know, ISS, would they have conducted that test? You know, would they have done that? Maybe not. So, you know, think about it, guys. Let, let's, let's cooperate with them, make them partners in civil space programs, and that will bleed over into other areas. It will make them think twice about doing things that partners, their other partners may not like. Leroy Chow, thank you so much. Great to be with you, Miles.